In the high-stakes world of heavy industry where massive metal parts and extreme forces collide, one formidable machine rises above the rest, the hydraulic forging press. This mechanical behemoth is the biggest, baddest, and strongest player in any metal shop. With abilities bordering on supernatural, the hydraulic press can flatten, squeeze, and shape metal into precisely formed parts using thousands to tens of thousands of tons of pressure. When in operation, a heated metal workpiece or billet is placed between the upper and lower dies. The ram descends and the massive force flattens, squeezes, or forms the metal into the shape dictated by the dies. The high pressure causes the metal to flow and take the shape of the dies. The press works its magic using a combination of brute force and clever mechanics. Massive, multi-story frameworks house hydraulic systems that drive presses weighing thousands of tons. The key lies in hydraulic fluid, transformed into powerful forces able to shape steel like clay. Operators can carefully regulate the force and ram motion for different metal working needs. The presses enable near net shape forming of parts so that minimal additional machining is required after forging. These large hydraulic presses are commonly used for open and closed die forging. Open die forging works on simple shapes like rods, shafts, and discs. Closed die forging produces complex and precise parts like gears, connecting rods, and turbine discs. Biggest hydraulic presses can generate over 100,000 tons of pressure for extremely large forgings used in industries like aerospace, defense, energy, and heavy equipment manufacturing. These mega presses often weigh thousands of tons themselves and are several stories tall. This is friction welding. Joining two pieces of metal by rubbing them together at high speed and pressure. The friction between the two pieces of metal generates heat, which melts the surface layers and causes them to fuse together. The two parts are pressed together. One is spun super fast, heating up the joint to a plastic state. Once the optimal temp is reached, the spinning stops and more pressure is applied to forge the parts into one. The heating and cooling happen so fast, no cracks form. It's over in seconds. This method of welding was first developed by Soviet scientists back in the 50s. It was originally used to join railway wheels, but it has since been adapted for a wide variety of applications. Here it is being used to join both end of a truck axle. This is powder metallurgy, a manufacturing process where metal powders are compacted into desired shapes and then sintered, heated to just below the melting point, to bond the particles. Metal powders are produced by mechanical grinding or chemical processes. The powder particles are usually 1 to 100 microns in size. Different powders are blended to obtain the desired composition. Small amounts of lubricants or binders may be added to improve powder flow and compacting properties. The powder is compacted into a mold or dye at high pressures to form a green compact with the desired shape. The green compact is heated to a temperature below the melting point, causing the powder particles to bond via diffusion and form a solid part. 
Sintering occurs in controlled atmospheres like hydrogen, nitrogen, or vacuum. Additional finishing operations like coining, repressing, heat treatment, or machining may be done to achieve final dimensional accuracy and properties. Powder metallurgy produces less material waste compared to machining methods. High production rates and low costs since complex shapes can be mass produced. This is thread rolling. Thread rolling and spline rolling are metal forming processes used to produce threaded parts or spline shafts by plastically deforming the material rather than cutting. In thread rolling, a blank cylinder of metal is pressed between two rotating dies. The dies have the reverse pattern of the thread to be engraved on them. As the blank rotates between the dies, the pressure forms the thread pattern on the surface. With each revolution, the thread becomes more defined. The process compresses and strengthens the metal, creating a precisely formed thread faster and more efficiently than cutting or grinding. Spline rolling works on a similar principle. Splines are grooves or ridges on a shaft that mesh with corresponding grooves on a mating piece. The spline shaft is pressed between two rotary dies with the spline pattern engraved. The high pressure causes metal flow to form the splines. Spline rolling is extremely accurate, allowing these critical parts to be mass produced. This is the process of hot winding a spring. It is used to make large heavy springs that are used in applications such as oil and gas drilling, construction equipment and heavy machinery. The process starts with a long straight piece of metal wire that is heated to a high temperature. The wire is fed into a spring coiling machine that wraps it around a mandrel under tension. The mandrel determines the inside diameter of the spring. As the wire wraps around, the coils are formed according to the desired specifications. The hot spring is then quenched immediately in a bath of oils. The oil helps control the cooling rate. Quenching results in the formation of martensite, which is a very hard microstructure. This gives the springs high strength and elasticity. This is a CNC spring coiler. The coiling process is automated through the CNC programming. The operator enters the specifications for the coil spring, such as the wire diameter coil diameter, length, pitch, end configurations, etc. Advanced CNC spring coilers can produce complex spring shapes beyond just simple cylindrical coils. The programmability offers flexibility and accuracy in the coiling process. This is called gear shaper. It is used to cut teeth into gears. The gear blank is mounted on an indexing fixture that rotates the blank precisely between cuts. This allows the cutter to generate the appropriate tooth profile as it moves across the blank. The cutter has a tooth profile that matches the inverse of the desired gear tooth profile. As the cutter moves across the gear blank, it cuts a profile that matches the shape of the cutter into the blank. The linear stroke of the cutter, combined with the indexed rotation of the gear blank between strokes, results in the progressive generation of the gear teeth. Another way of cutting teeth into gears is hobbing, by using a specialized cutting tool called a hob. The hob is a cylinder with helical cutting teeth arranged along its length. It looks similar to a worm gear. The workpiece, gear blank, rotates at a constant speed while the hob rotates and moves axially at a specific ratio to generate the gear tooth profile. The teeth on the hob correspond to the shape of the teeth being cut into the gear. 
As the hob rotates and advances along the gear blank, the cutting teeth on the hob produce the matching gear tooth profile on the workpiece. This method is called broaching. This process is mainly used to cut internal teeth into hard materials using a cutting tool called a broach. The brooch contains a series of cutting teeth of progressively increasing height arranged along its length. This allows it to cut the full depth of a gear tooth space in one pass. For gear broaching, the brooch teeth are shaped to the precise profile of the gear teeth to be cut. The brooch is pushed or pulled through a hole or over a surface to produce the finished gear teeth. As the brooch passes over the gear blank, each tooth on the brooch progressively cuts deeper until the full form of the gear tooth space is generated. No indexing or multiple passes are required. Lubricating fluid is applied to the broaching operation to minimize friction and dissipate heat. Rigid setup and precision guides are used to maintain accuracy. Gears are often heat treated to increase their hardness and wear resistance. Induction hardening is a common technique used for gear hardening. The gear is placed inside an induction heating coil. The coil generates a high frequency alternating magnetic field which induces eddy currents in the surface of the gear. This rapidly heats up just the surface layer of the gear teeth to a high temperature, typically above the transformation temperature for hardening. Once the surface is heated to the desired temperature, the gear is quickly removed from the coil and quenched, usually in a bath of oil. This rapid cooling or quenching freezes the heated metal in a martensitic state, creating a very hard surface layer. The quenched gear may then be tempered by reheating to a temperature below the transformation point to impart some ductility and toughness to the hardened surface layer. This balances hardness with less brittleness. Laser hardening, also known as laser heat treatment, uses a high power laser beam to rapidly heat and cool the surface of a metal part. This creates a hardened case or layer on the metal surface while the core remains soft and ductile. It works by rapidly heating a thin surface layer to high temperatures often above the critical phase transformation temperature. This modifies the microstructure to form harder phases like martensite. The laser beam is focused to a small diameter spot and scanned across the metal surface to selectively harden areas. This allows complex shapes and patterns to be hardened. Cooling rates are very high, often over 106 degrees Celsius per second. This quenches the heated metal to form the harder microstructures. Cooling is often assisted using gas jets. This is laser cladding, an industrial technique used to apply a protective coating or build up worn or damaged metal surfaces on machine parts. It works by using a high power laser beam to melt metal powder or wire that is fed into the path of the laser beam as it travels across the substrate surface. The melted cladding material forms a metallurgical bond with the substrate as it rapidly cools and solidifies. Laser provides a concentrated heat source to locally melt the cladding material and substrate surface. Common lasers used are CO2 or fiber lasers with power levels ranging from 1 to 10 kilowatts. Cladding materials are typically metals or alloys in the form of powder or wire. Common materials are cobalt, nickel alloys, stainless steel, and titanium alloys. The cladding material has similar properties to the substrate.